Well, good evening, everyone, my Facebook family and friends. I'm Chantel, you guys know me, and this is our weekly live broadcast. Girl, share your story. Every week we come here and we talk with a very special guest about um, their life story and what is their life's mission and how that particular mission can help you in some part of your journey. And so I'm so happy that you are watching us live and those of you who are gonna watch this replay, welcome. Uh, take out your notepad or your phone and take some notes because I'm telling you my guests, they drop major jewels. And of course, this is an interactive conversation. So I wanna see you in the comments, just writing down what stood out, what is standing out and what questions you may have for our guest tonight. And like we do every week, I want you to share some virtual hugs and some hearts. That's how we do our clapping okay. in this virtual world that we're living in. Um, so without further ado, I have a wonderful guest on tonight. Her name is Corel Pender. And if you have a very flavorful Caribbean accent, you can say that way better than me. <laughs> but uh, she is um, a woman who I have uh, come to admire because she is not only a great writer uh, with an awesome book that's out. I want you guys to check it out, but she'll tell you about it. Um, but she's also a podcaster, has a very great podcast that is nice to listen to because her accent is so sweet. And she drops major jewels on that as well. So Carell, um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and why you decided to share your story today. Uh, thank you so much, Chantel. I'm excited to be here. Um, as you mentioned, I am, I have an accent, so I'm from the Bahamas. I live in the Bahamas. I was born and raised in the Bahamas. And one of the reasons I wanted to come on and share my story, I've been sharing my story, I think, from to publicly, probably 2013. I took, I took a year off of dating in 2013, and now that I think about it, I've been sharing my story from then. And so anytime someone does come to me and ask me, can you share... Um, your story with others, I'm always like, yes, no problem, because I know that a lot of people can relate to having a similar journey, and that journey is going on one of feeling like my life is all planned out, like it's gonna happen like this. I'm gonna get, you know, I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna graduate at 21, then I'm gonna get married right after, maybe 22, then I'm gonna have two children, a white picket fence, a dog, a house, right. and life is gonna just be amazing, like everything that I've done. And, you know, there's a quote that's so funny that says, um, you want to make God laugh. Tell him your plans. Tell him your plans. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've all been there before. Like, literally, I was 25 years old. Um, I was in the middle of, like, one of the best parts of my life, which was I graduated, finished all my school, started my business, was, you know, dating NFL players and working with clients who were, like, you know, very famous. And mm -hmm. everything seemed like it was going right, Carell. But I found myself one day um, in my really lovely apartment, Buckhead, Atlanta. And I was in the shower by myself and I just started to cry. I was like, God, send me somebody because I'm meeting everyone who looks good on paper, but my soul doesn't feel like they belong to me. And um, I don't know if you've had one of those moments in your life where you were just like, oh my goodness, I need a shift in terms of that relationship. Um, journey what what was that like for you what were you in the shower crying or was that just my story <laughs> i've been several places crying but i found that anytime i've had a real like breakdown crying it's normally like on a floor and i'm like in a fetal position of god what's going on um just right. overwhelmed but i remember in a season of wanting a shift so i was in a relationship i think i was in a relationship for like four years and um, we just weren't on the same page. Like I said, I thought I was gonna be married at 21. So I think by this time we've been dating for like three or four years and I'm like 26 in this relationship at this point. And so I'm just like, you know, are we gonna get married? Not realizing at the time that I wasn't really ready or in the mind frame of where God would want me to be, um, to be married. But I was just like, you date for four years, you get married. Like that's what happened. And so I remember, um, they, it was a long distance relationship and I ended up um, kissing somebody else and they ended up finding out about it. And it was this whole like big blow up, like you cheated on me and it's over. And it was just, it was not good. And I spent a year and a half trying to repair that relationship. 
and they were they were going with the motions but it was like i don't think they ever could get back to the point of i trust you and i want to do this relationship again but they weren't quite ready to say it's over so it was kind of like a dangling carrot of you feeling like okay will we get back together and they're not they're being like okay i'm not sure and so eventually like a year and a half i was like everybody was saying to me like you need to just let it go like they clearly don't want to spend the rest of their life with you um they probably they probably just don't know how to just say like we'd already broken up but it was a year and a half of i don't know what this is and so it was during that time when it when i was saying that i needed a shift I needed to do something differently. And there's a quote that says, if you want something you never had before, you have to do something you never did before. And so- What what was that difference for you? Um, because you talked about this gentleman that you were in a relationship with. And I want us to um, all come on the line and show Carell some love because you know there are many people here who have someone in their life right now that things aren't working out. They, they want for the best. Like I was at that place where I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Like my friends were like, Chantel, you just made it big. Like this guy just signed a $17 million contract. Like you think that everything is going to go right, but there was a separation that had to take place and you may not have wanted it, but he did. How do you transition from wanting to hold on to what you think, um, you know, is a manifestation of your plans, but in reality, it would just be a type and shadow of what you really truly want. And I like what you said just now about a manifestation of your plans. And cause that's exactly what it was. Hanging on to that relationship was a manifestation of my plans. Me trying to feel like I could control my life when the only person I can, that is in control is, is God, when I gave my life to God. And so what I had to come to the realization of was understanding my worth. Because if you are, for me in that situation, I was hanging on to someone that obviously wasn't trying to get back together with me. Um, they weren't trying to, they weren't being definite with plans. They weren't including me. And if they got, and if I, I addressed it, then they could always say the cop out. Well, we're not together. Mm. Well, I never said we were together. Oh, well you cheated. Oh, it's always, and, and at one point, and it was a gift. It really was a gift in the moment. It didn't feel like a gift, but it was around the same time that I let go. I was saying, you know, I just, I'm hanging on because I thought we were going to get married. Mm. And he said, honestly, I just feel that you're too selfish of a person for me to marry. And at that time, yeah, that's the, it was like darts. At that time it was like, I'm sorry, what? Um, it was like a blow to your ego. It was like, you've just invested now, by this time, I think it's like five and a half years that you've invested in it. And it's just like, but in retrospect, years later now, now that I've done the healing, now that I've done the work, now that I've taken the time with God, now, I realized that you were selfish. You weren't ready for a relationship. There were things going on in your heart. And that doesn't mean like, oh, I missed out on that person because I definitely don't think that person was was for me. And not right. that bad person, it's just that that was not who I was supposed to do purpose with. And so what God has to do is, God knew that I wouldn't walk away. God was like, all right, you won't go walk away. You And that's what we do. We're holding on to that and not understanding our worth, not realizing who we are. And so that's why sometimes God allows the person to leave. That's why God allows the person to be distant. And we're holding on to something and there's nothing there. If you are currently in a relationship or in a situation and you're holding on and saying, okay, it's not exactly how I would hope it to be, but I don't want to start over. Start over. Hmm. Start it's over. Go ahead and write that in the chat. Start over. It is okay to start over. I mean, people think that life is short. I say that life is absolutely long because each and every day you have an opportunity to change something about yourself, change something about your life and don't get caught up in, you know, appearing to not be perfect or you told all your friends and your family that you were going to get married by a certain date to this certain guy. And then you realize like, oh, maybe this isn't the guy for me. It's absolutely OK. It's much better to stop and start over than to live a life of misery with the person that you know that you were not supposed to marry. So talk to us about that. Um, Ashton said, blessings. Uh, Lachelle is feeling you right now. And a fellow um, person from the Bahamas. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so much love happening in, in the chat. Ashton's like, yes, it's absolutely okay to start over. So you're starting over though was sort of by force. And then you realize like, oh yeah, in retrospect, I'm glad I did have to have to start over. 
So what was that thrust for you in, um, I know the gentleman didn't want to be in a relationship, but what mm -hmm. made you take the shift into this one year of celibacy and no dating? Right. Um, so what happened was, like I said, they, they said, I don't know. They didn't say no. And that's the thing. It was a dangling carrot. There was never a definite, no, we're not going to be together. Um, and so because they refused to say it, even though that's what was going on in their heart, but they refused to say it, I had to make the decision that you have to make the clean break. You have to leave because you, you, and I think that after a year and a half, that's when I knew. And I had family members saying like, you need to walk away. So there was a friend that I had who was a pastor and he had just recently gotten married. And I said, how, how did you know your wife was the one? Like, how did you know your wife was the one? Because I'm struggling to stay in this for the last five and a half years. And he was like, because she had everything that I was looking for. And I was like, okay, but that's a little vague. I'm gonna need more than that. And so he was like, what I'm gonna give you is I want you to watch a series. And the series is called The New Rules of Love, Sex and Dating by Pastor Andy Stanley. And that series changed my life. So I watched this series and I'm still in the middle of that relationship at the time. And I hear Andy Stanley talk about if you haven't been dating the way that God wants you to date, you've been in unsuccessful relationships, you've been in relationships that fail and you haven't done things God's way, then you need to take a year off. You need to take a year off and just focus on God and focus on getting to know you. And so when I first heard that, I was like, oh, hell to the no, I am 26. I think I was like 26 or 27. I was like, and I had this goal. Like first it was 21, then it was 25, then it was 30. I was like, that's just crazy to not like, I don't know, growing up, you just felt like if you don't get married by 30, I don't know. Like you just, where like, did we get that from? <laughs> <laughs> like, if it don't happen by 30, like, something wrong. Like, and so I was like, at 27, take a year off? No, no, I do not want to do that. No. Um, but I watched it, like, two months later, and I heard him say it again. And so that's when I decided, I said, you know what? I said, if I heard this twice, um, there's a reason. And I, I just need to walk away. And so I did. I took the year off. I took the year off of dating. And... It was the hardest decision I ever made, but it was the best decision I ever made. It was hard though. It really what was, was hard, hard about it. I mean, besides the obvious, but tell us what was hard about it. Yeah. So the obvious, one of the obvious is when I was in relationships before, even though um, I professed Christianity, I was living very lukewarm. So I was having sexual relationships with the person that I was dating. So when you decide to, okay, I'm going to give a year to God, that means you got to close your legs too. And so you're like, how long, how long am I going to close the legs for Jesus? <laughs> so, so, so I did. And then you, you also meet people like you never meet people who are like amazing when you're not dating or I mean, when you, you, you never, but as soon as I'm like year for God, you meet someone who's like, they love Jesus. They got a good job. They're interested. They're they intentional. <laughs> it's like, but I had made the commitment. And so all any anybody that I met like that, I had to say, well, I made a commitment to stay with God. So I'm going to have to just stay with God during this journey and watch those people fall out of my life and fall into the life of other people because you've made this commitment to God. And so I made it through that year and I was proud of myself. But I think what was really, really hard, and I talked about it on the podcast, I had a very transactional relationship with God. Mm. And to be honest, what, is that, what does that even mean? So the transactional relationship with God is I will be obedient because I want you to bless me. That's the only reason I'm being obedient. I'm not being obedient because I love you. I'm not being obedient because I trusted your path and your will is better for me. I'm being obedient because I did it. Now, where's my price? Where's now, my let me just interrupt you right there. And um, Ash and I agree. I love the transparency. You know, that's one reason why I was attracted to Carell and her podcast is, is because she's honest, right? Sometimes you'll get the fluff, you'll get the, you know, I'll tell you a little bit, but not really the truth. And that's not what people need. And so thank you for pointing that out, um, Ashton. So talk to us about that transactional relationship. Do you think that that's why, like in your prayer time and your revelation, do you think that that's why God didn't bring you the husband at 21 and the kids at 25? It's because he never felt like you served him in truth? Or do you think that there's just a, a different path that you're on? So I think that God has so much grace and mercy that the time was a gift. The time was a gift. So I don't like to look at it as punishment. Like, oh, because you have transactional relationship with me, I will hold these things from you. 
it's so much that I have things for you. I have greatness for you. And I want your character to be ready. And so if I have to give you this gift of, of, of taking this time to really know me, to really build a good foundation with me, to really love me and know me, when I take you to those blessings, they won't crumble because you would have learned how to give your heart over to me. You would have learned to recognize the things that are in you that are not like me. And therefore, when I take you to those places of marriage and motherhood and platforms to speak and places to write books, then people would be able to see me in you and you not trying to think that it's about you. And so it was, it didn't always feel like a gift, but I think that the time was not, oh, let me punish her because she's being transactional. Let me help her out. I can't let her go into certain arenas if she doesn't get that foundation with me, if she doesn't know what it means to love me unconditionally, if she doesn't know that, then she's going to mess up the places that I want to carry her. So in my loving, gracious, sovereign will, I, I'm going to keep her right here. I'm going to keep her hidden. I'm going to keep her hidden in the process. That That's the gift that I'm going to give to her. That is powerful for you to see that as a gift, because sometimes, you know, our gifts come wrapped in sandpaper. And for you, the sandpaper was the weight. And I'm sure the weight was uncomfortable. I'm sure that, you know, those guys who are attractive on paper and in person uh, came at you like, you know, flies onto honey. It was tempting. So tell us about that, the weight and the discomfort. How did you find solace in that process? Because some people would say, okay, God, well, I did it for 90 days. Let's celebrate now. <laughs> now <laughs> have more reward. Yeah. Well, I was definitely like that. That's what I'm saying. And uh, Ty, thanks so much. Ty said that's really honest to say. I've totally been there. God calls me out all the time. And mm -hmm. I always, I always, I don't come for people. I just tell you how God been coming for me. So if that convicts you during that time, then that's you and God. But he really does come for you. Like Ty was saying, like he comes for you. And so that weight was very, very heavy. Very. And, uh, and it was after the year, it was like, where you at? Way at she's like, I was pissed. So you were still in that transaction in 2014 because I took the year off in 2013. When 2014 hit, <laughs> hello, hello, you said take a year off. I did. I need, I need the prize. So after, so I was like, okay, okay, maybe 2014. And I had a lot of blessings in 2014. Like I became um, a playwright in 2014. I got a new uh -oh. job. Carol's pause right now. <laughs> Oh, your phone froze a bit there. Um, oh. But but that's, we got the gist of it is that it's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to figure out and ask God, why? Why am I not seeing the, the fruits of my labor, right? Um, some of us want to, you know, plant a seed today and then tomorrow expect cabbage. It takes time. My husband and I were gardening now. So I, I planted cauliflower a couple of weeks ago and I was expected to come overnight. It didn't come overnight. I ended up forgetting about it. And then four, five months later, I see this big blossom of cabbage in my garden. So anything worth having is going to take time. And if you're if you feel that and if you know that to be true, I want you to type that in the chat. It takes time. But during that process of waiting, I know there are certain strategies that you use, Corral, that I believe that you shared in your book and on your podcast. Um, about what you did during that waiting period. Share that with us, if you could. Yeah, I would strategies. definitely. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to do, like I said, even though I was being obedient and it was transactional, I was still being obedient. And I think God honors that obedience. And so there were a lot of areas of my life that I completely surrendered. My mom told me that the other day. She said, you surrender in every other area except your relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because I surrendered in a lot of areas, I saw growth. I saw blessings. I saw an overwhelming amount of blessings. And so, so there were things I did. So I traveled a lot, um, during these last few years, more than I've traveled before. I've been to Italy. I've been to South Africa. I've been to Germany. I've been to, um, the Philippines. That was before that, but yeah, I traveled a whole lot during the season. I also became a playwright. And so it was always doing the next thing that God said to do and stepping out on faith with the next thing that he said to do. So, um, becoming a playwright. I got another master's degree. I lived in, yeah, I lived in LA for a while and I did a screenwriting course. I shot a documentary. I wrote two books. So he was blessing me even in this waiting season. And I think what happens is 
if we get so consumed about this one thing that I want, um, I heard a lady describe it before. She said her children were on a playground and there was a area across the street that they wanted to go. And she said, I don't feel like it's safe for you to walk across the street, but there's a whole playground here that you guys can, can play on. And she said, they stood by the fence the whole day, just watching over and mm -hmm. not playing with the playground behind them. And I think that's what we do. Like God is presenting all of these blessings, but the only thing that we can see is that you didn't give me that. You didn't have a vision. Mm -hmm. You didn't give me that. And so one of the things that I feel like I have been able to do to maximize this season um, is just giving it to God and allowing him to say, I want you to write a book. Okay. I'll write a book. Okay. I want you to write a play. Okay. I'll write a play. I want you to do this. So being obedient when it came to purpose, when it, I, I did a mission trip in Greece. So just always being obedient to the next thing that he says to do. Um, but I think 2020 when everything stood still and you couldn't move, I think that's when God says, this is when I want you to give me your heart, your whole heart. Like wow. I want us to dig into pride. I want us to dig into jealousy and envy. I want us to dig into selfishness. I want us to dig into the fact that you don't fully trust me, that I'm not Lord. Like we say these words and we don't really comprehend what it means, but the word Lord means that I am, I've given him permission to rule over my life. And so I need us to deal with that. Let's dig that up. And so I think this year was about really breaking up that foundation. Cause as I mentioned earlier, in order for him to take me into different spaces, yeah. Um, I really wanted me to have that solid foundation of he is enough. Hmm. He is absolutely enough. And I think obedience is really key. And when you're obedient, it's not that the door that you've been knocking on for years is going to automatically open. It takes time. But guess what? In that process, God is going to open other doors that you may have forgot about that or were dormant. And he's going to allow you to see that inside of your obedience, there are multiple opportunities for blessings. So don't be afraid to, to just surrender it all. I know during my waiting process, Carol, I, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was not um, serving Christ the way that a, a Christian would. Um, and in fact, I was so out of the realm of his will that I didn't even, I, I lost hope in finding a, 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 a husband. I only surrendered to him in that shower on that day because I felt hopeless. Everything looked good on paper. I was a, a public success, but a private failure because I'm just like, I've done everything right, but I don't know what more I can do to try to get uh, a man, right? A man that I, I liked and the man that really gelled with me. Right. And, um, but so what I realized, and it wasn't until honestly like five years later last year, that I realized that in my pursuit of a man, literally, I was like, God, send me a man. I am tired. Okay? <laughs> what can you hear? <laughs> right. But in my pursuit of a man, I actually discovered the man, the man himself, Jesus Christ. I discovered God for myself. And it did not dawn on me. I'm talking, you know, whole country later, whole marriage later, whole two kids later. I did not discover the revelation of my desire and my very simple prayer because i remember i was not serving god so i didn't even know how to pray i was just like god like send me somebody in that simplicity of reaching out and surrendering letting him know that i was tired of being stupid and making these dumb decisions in that simplicity god was like okay i'm gonna open up a door for for her because now she's listening he moved heaven and earth corral to to put me in front of the man that i knew would be my husband I'm talking my first time going to Las Vegas, his first time in America, and out of a conference of 20,000 people, Ty, Ashton, let me tell you, we happened to just be in a line because we were like doing some network marketing back then. So if you've ever been to a network marketing conference, it's like huge people from Greece, from Germany, from all over in like a big Vegas hotel. And our particular conference room had 2,000 people. And... Um, I got there late. People were camping out like five o'clock in the morning and they were all waiting for the doors to open up at nine. And I'm rolling in because I'm in Vegas by myself. So I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Here for this business conference. I go to the front of the line thinking I'm going to slide in and nobody's going to notice. 
And the people are looking at me like, no, we've been here since 5 a.m. Send her to the back. <laughs> so they made me look like an absolute fool, but I was okay. So the security guard's like, I'm sorry, ma'am, you're gonna have to go to the back. So in my route to the back, in my disobedience, right? He humbled <laughs> me, sent me to the back of the line and I'm still putting my PR face on. So I'm like, let me see if I can say hi to somebody, meet somebody or something. Cause that line was jive long. And um, even in my disobedience, Carell, he blessed me because the one person that smiled at me and gave me a welcome face, I slid in the line with them, started talking. And um, we, we had some real good conversation. Turns out they were from the islands. And so we had, well, not that in common, but I liked their accent. Right. And, um, in the midst of this 10 minute conversation with one particular guy, I see like almost like a solar eclipse just overtakes the room. And then I'm five one. So I look down and I see the shadow and I look up and it's this gentleman, bright smile, tall, dark and handsome, smiling down on me with a look that made me feel like he had known me his whole life. Mm. And immediately I knew he was my husband. I knew it. <laughs> and my, I went back to my room that night and I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I found my husband because I was like rooming with these girls from Atlanta, but I didn't know them. And they're like, girl, you're crazy. What you mean you found your husband? I'm like, I think I found my husband. <laughs> but little did they know, four months ago, I was in that shower and I asked God, send me somebody. Little did they know is that shortly after that conversation with God, I had long locks down to my, my shoulders. Um, I had cut my hair. I'll tell you why that's significant. Cut my locks. I was like, I want a fresh start. I'm starting over. Everybody, you know, said I was crazy for that, too, because you know how we get caught up sometimes with our hair. And um, and I just started to follow this process of newness. I didn't even almost recognize myself. So when I went to the hotel and I told my friends that they didn't know all of these processes that I had gone through prior to that mm -hmm. encounter, they didn't know that uh, 48 hours before I had come to the hotel, I was on the plane to Vegas and God spoke to me, the Holy Spirit, mind you, not serving God. I never heard his voice before up until that point. And here's what he said to me, Corral. He said that if you want me to send you someone, tell me everything that you want in that person. Lachelle, Ashton, I promise you, when I get on a flight, the minute they say, buckle your seatbelts, we're now taking a, I'm asleep, like knocked out cold. <laughs> and the flight sent from Atlanta to Vegas is five hours, so I get mad beauty sleep during that time. Well, I couldn't sleep. I heard God's voice. Took out my pen, took out my pen, wrote down nine points. Come on. Uh, Jesus. We went out, but then we went in. Yeah. Can you? Eight hours later, I meet my husband and Wale. Now I'm telling you, of all the five billion people, nine, how many people live in the world? Eight billion? Seven. Are we, are we still live? Check chat if you can still hear me. I think we are. Thumbs up if you can. Can they? Or is it? Oh gosh, me too. <laughs> the show said we're out cold. You, you got me. We're we're good. All right, we're yeah. back on. We're back on. Keep going in and out. Best parts always want to fade in and out, but um, okay, I think we're good now. Yep. So as I was saying, um, out of eight billion people in the world. He happened to think enough of me, this little disobedient girl from Atlanta and moved heaven and earth to orchestrate the perfect timing for me and my husband and Wale to meet each other. I mean, have we been 10 seconds too soon or two minutes too late? Like it just would not have happened. And so I just shared that story, um, Corral, because your testimony of being obedient is not that the door that you want to open is going to open. It just so happened to unlock in my case, but God is going to present you with an opportunity in your road to obedience to receive the blessings that he has in store. It's like a um, one of those 
video games, like you, you go through like a little tunnel or whatever, and then you activate one level of, of yep. tokens and then, you know, so it may not be in a chronological order like you had expected, but trust is plan. Talk to yep. us more about your trust, because I know that the, your journey isn't over yet. Tell us no. about that. No, I am still single. I am not dating. I am 35. And I just remember, like like I said, thinking like you would be married by 30. But one of the things that God, what I would say before um, this year was, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if God has marriage for me. And I remember in 2017, watching a couple saying that marriage, everybody won't get married just because you want to get married. Because, you know, mm -hmm. people would say the scripture, like, God will give you desires of your heart. Um, and they were saying like, we have desires all the time that God doesn't grant. So God delight yourself in the Lord. So when you have that relationship with God, he puts his desires in you and that will happen for you. And so for the longest, I'm like, well, does he want me to be married? Does he not? You know, like I didn't, I didn't know. And it wasn't until 2020 when having those intimate conversations with him and being, uh, you know, transparent about digging out the jealousy, digging out pride and envy that he told me, I do have it for you. And so hearing that, I was able to rest in, he has it for me. His timing is perfect. It's not going to be easy. If, if I'm trusting God and as long as I continue to follow him, then he's going to bring it in the perfect time. And so I know sometimes people say to single women and single women feel like, oh, something's wrong with you because you're not married. And I was doing a live the other night and someone said, and the lady asked the question, she said, is it safe to say that they're not doing what they need to be doing if they're um, not married? And I said, I can't say that. I'm not in your, I'm not in their life. I say we all have our own lives and our own personal relationship with God. So if there is a single woman who's out there saying, I feel like I'm doing everything right, um, like it's some kind of I have to cross this T and dot this I and go through this tunnel and whatever, and then it unlocks. I just would say continue every day to allow God to search your heart. Allow God to search your heart. Ask him these things that you're you're going to him for. And in his time, he will reveal it. And I think in that time of waiting for him to give that confirmation that it is going to happen, or I do have this particular blessing for you, is the trust. The trust that he's the creator. So he knows what's best for my life more than I do. I only have this view right here. He knew me before I was in my mother's womb. He knows the day that I will die. And so therefore, if anyone knows what's best for the next step of my life, it's Christ. And so even though it, I didn't want it at 35, I have to trust that, like I said, those last eight years of singleness, those last eight years of celibacy, all of those years of just waiting and trusting God, building up to what it, it was for a reason, it was for a purpose. But I know, I know that he has it for me. I know I just was boldly able to say it this year and the enemy will try to say like, well, it's not here yet. But I, I've claimed it over and over in faith. I know God. I know his word is true. Um, he's a man of his word. Um, and he's promised it to me. And I, I'm just trusting his timing for when he brings it forth. And I know that it's going to be amazing. I know that um, it's going to be in his perfect will. And so that's, I think, the way that I was able to, to deal with this moment and still being in this moment of singleness and not dating is the fact that I got to this close intimacy with God where I'm trusting him. And... And it's like um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they said, you know, God has the power to rescue us out of this fire. And even if, even if, even if. Absolutely. Even if. And I, I love that so much. And um, man, God bless you so much for just your, your trust. Like that is amazing. You know how they say that, you know, um, Oh, you know, submission is better than sacrifice. Um, the fact that you are submitted to Christ in such a, a vulnerable way, you know what I mean? Most of us want to protect. We want to know what the next step is before we, you know, decide to, to go forward. And you're just like, you know what? I'm okay. I think that that is such a grace and a peace that you have over your life, Corral, that I think that if you don't take anything else away from this session, Take that. Uh, take the fact that, you know, you don't have to know where the whole staircase leads before you take that next step. As long as you are in God's will and accepting of his plans, which are the best plans for your life. Like Carol said, he created you. He shaped you. He formed you before you were even took a breath. Like he knows every hair on your head. So and he cares about you. But just perhaps that marriage is not in the cards for you. It's still okay. Like, there's nothing wrong. 
there's nothing wrong with your life um, if it doesn't happen. Carol, are you still there? Um, I think. have than your plans. And so um, I want Carell to get back on the line so that she can tell us more about her journey. And I love what I'm seeing in the comments, Ashton, you know, for everything works together for good. Yes, it does. Um, we have another uh, viewers saying that trust God's plans and his promises indeed because his plans and his promises I mean he writes the best stories um, we have authors on here who are sharing their story but truly God writes the best stories we have two of you <laughs> there you go um, so <laughs> let, let's talk about about um, that more your faith being a cornerstone for your victory um, how do you, what do you do on a daily basis besides diverting your attention to other spaces in your life? But like, what's your, what's your lifestyle like to help you, you know, just, just stay, enjoy the weight? Right. To stay connected. One of the things that I started to do during this journey, um, because we have more time off, like I said, during um, the Corona, the whole stop. And I feel like God kind of stopped everybody in their lives for different reasons. Like everybody kind of needed a timeout. Um, and so I think my personal time out was, like I said, to form that connection, that intimacy with him that I didn't have before. And so one of the things that how my daily schedule looks when I have devotion, I was talking to a friend on the um, my birthday and I was saying, yeah, I, um, I could spend four hours in devotion. And they're like, four hours? Four hours doing what? Like, what are you doing for four hours? But there's there's the time of prayer. There's the time of worship music. So time when I'm just listening to the worship music and then time when I'm going into prayer and that's writing down prayers, that's saying prayers out loud, that's putting a prayer on a prayer wall. Then that's writing down my gratitude journal. Every day I write three things that I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of sit still for a while and just listen to anything God is trying to download in me, any revelations, any things he want to bring forth. Um, I also read. Um, so right now I'm reading a Joyce Myers book on living courageously. And then I still, uh, when I go for a run, I listen to a podcast, I listen to different podcasts when I run. And so I'll probably put on a sermon or probably put on, um, a different Christian leader during that time. And before that I do the Bible app. So I'm currently reading. So before I go on the run, I'm currently reading the Bible in one year. And so they'll give you like four chapters a day with the devotional with it. And so that's kind of what my spending time with God looks like. And you you said earlier, you asked, you said, you know, where does that that faith come from, that trust? Like you're nothing that you feel God is saying is coming, you can actually see. So where does that faith and trust come from? And for me, um, like I said, at the beginning of when that things started to shut down at, in March, God kind of showed me this vision. Like I have some things that I have for you, but he's kind of holding them back because I need you to get your heart right. And yeah. I took six weeks, um, to fast. And during that time, almost immediately after we got the biggest account that I've ever gotten with my company. And so I've seen, and through this whole pandemic, I've just seen job after, like we booked that and then you book something else and then you book something else. And then you think like, well, I thought that that, that that was enough, but God is just continuing to open the door. So I'm already seeing it. It's kind of like what you were saying when you were sharing your testimony about you spoke to God four months before. And so as he was telling you to do different things, uh, you know, cut the hair and do this and do that. And as he was, he told you to write something down when you went in the airplane, it's like that. It's like, I know, I don't know when, but I know he's preparing me for something and I just got to trust it. And because I've seen it. And so for any time when someone feels discouraged, like I'm in this season, I've been trusting forever and I don't see it. I like to say, think back to when God did come through because yes. it's a time in our life when God did come through. And so it's so recent. I can't even in this time be like, well, I felt like I was hearing this from March and I don't see anything. It's like in March, I was hearing that God had blessings in general. And so I don't get to decide exactly how they look like the exact timing, but it's perfect. And I've seen him come through. And so I know, I know that he's real. I know that his promises are real. And so I just, 
I'm enjoying that season because like I said, he has to be the foundation. So anytime I get to a point where I'm idolizing something or want it more than I want God's time, I know that I need to check my heart posture. And so that's real. That's how I can learn to trust because I know that having a relationship with God is going to be better than anything he ever brings me. Hmm. Having a relationship with God is going to be better than anything he ever brings you. Yes, because you mentioned in your podcast, with every blessing, there's a level of burden too. When you have children, they're tremendous blessings, girl. Let me tell you, those cute little faces, but you still got to clean after them. You still got to clean up and sweep the floor, not once a day, four, five, six times a day, okay? So, I mean, I can go on, but you wouldn't trade the blessing in because it has a level of burdens. Um, so let, let's go to the chat because it's lighting up. It's yeah. lighting up. We Thank have Grace. She says that patience, when a baby is premature, it takes more effort to keep it alive. Let your love come in God's divine timing so that your relationship could be healthy, solid, full of love, and certainly God ordained. I love that. Yes. I love that. I, I love that. Like she said, premature baby. And I've told people sometimes too, like it's like a cake. You don't want to take the cake out of the oven before it's ready. So God, if I'm not ready, keep me, keep me in there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because when you get it, it's going to be oh so sweet. Oh, so sweet. And and those 30 years or 10, 15 years that you feel like, or that someone may feel like they missed out on, man, God's going to add the other 15 later down in life. And so where others are going to check out at a certain time, you're going to keep on living and enjoying that guy that he specifically designed and arranged for you. Um, we have Ashton who said, you know, I must admit that I have a more profound outlook and respect for the level that you are on. You thank you very much. You are very much connected to the spirit of God. That's huge. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ashton. You. <laughs> I love it. So um, with that, um, you know, Carol, let, let us know what you're doing now and how people can stay connected to you and work with you. Uh, let the people know because they obviously want to hear. <laughs> All right. So we have the podcast, like you mentioned. Um, that's where you have the opportunity to listen to a lot of my story. And that's the Royal Access. And that's on any podcast platform, whether you have Apple, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. It's the Royal Access, Karel Pinder, K-E-R-E-L-P-I-N-D-E-R. -E -E um, I'm on Instagram at Karel Pinder 1908. I have two books. Um, they're on Amazon. They're the One Year Challenge and May I Call You Queen. So it's the One Year Challenge and May I Call You Queen. Um, and the One Year Challenge is about that journey of taking that year off of dating. Um, and May I Call You Queen is allowing God to be the fulfillment in your life. Um, we chase so many things in life, whether it's relationships, children, a certain job, but none of that brings fulfillment like God will. And so allowing him to you know, be the person that makes you feel secure and enough. So allowing him to call you queen. And so that's what May I Call You Queen is about. So yeah, so those two books are on Amazon. May I Call You Queen, the, um, the One Year Challenge, and then The Royal Access is the podcast. We also have a group on Facebook called The Royal Access for Women who just talk about, I shared this episode in that group as well, but we just kind of talk about things that God is doing in our lives and just share a lot about the podcast in there too. Wonderful, wonderful. So go and check out the podcast and those two books and start your own one year challenge. Uh, Carell will be so happy to assist you on that journey. And, um, you know, I'm so glad that you decided to come and share your story, Carell, because I know it really was an inspiration to me. Um, I wish I had half the strategies that you had <laughs> that you have, um, because maybe that four month period would have been a lot shorter. But I thank God that he works in us on um, both the will and to do. Uh, according to his good pleasure. And so I want you to just remember to not only wait, but wait in God because he has the best plans for your life. And um, when you get to the point where you are ready to share your story, be sure to hit me up. On Friday, we'll be doing a live webinar where I'll show you how to transform your story and turn it into a best-selling book. So with that, y'all share the love. Make sure you go to um, girlshareyourstory.com and uh, we will see you on our next conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next time. Thank you.